Hmm. Hey everybody, Dr. D here. It's good to see you again. Uh, welcome back to our unit on hypothesis testing. Today we're going to talk about uh, step one of the hypothesis testing process. There are five steps. Um, and where we're going to start is at the start. We're going to formulate hypotheses. Uh, and for the purposes of this uh, unit, what we're going to, when we're just learning, we're going to look at tests of mu x, sigma x known. Although I will say that for now, it doesn't actually matter whether we know sigma x or not. For step one, it's not not relevant. It doesn't come into play. But let's begin at the beginning. When we are formulating hypotheses, we are always going to have pairs of them. And those pairs are always going to contain a null hypothesis, and which we call H0, and H subscript A, which is an alternative hypothesis. That's not hypotheses, it should be cis hypothesis. Okay, so we've got these two and knowing which is which is critical and it takes practice and it takes intuition and I, I, I want you to lean on deep understanding like deep understanding like we talked about before. So deep understanding really means getting to understand why you're doing what it is you're doing, not, not just knowing how to go through the motions. So critical to understand is that the null hypothesis gets the benefit of the doubt. That is to say that at the very beginning of every hypothesis testing process, the null hypothesis is assumed to be true. Because it's assumed to be true, and then the rest of the steps are just logical progressions, if we get to the end and we reach some contradiction, that means that something went wrong. And the weakest point in this process is, uh, is this assumption right here. And so if we assumed that this was true and then we reached a, a contradiction, then that means that this can be proven false. This assumption is the weakest link. And so if we reach a, a contradiction, then the null must be false. And that's, that's really the, the design of this process. Alternatively, the alternative uh, is assumed to be false. At the very beginning, we assume that um, that this is false. Now this linkage right here, this is pretty logically intuitive. This next one is a little bit less so. Because the alternative is assumed to be false, it can be proven true. But in order to do that, we're going to have to be really careful about how we set up uh, the null and the alternative. And we will be. We will always set it up such that if the null is false, the alternative is true. But to do that, we have to be a little bit careful. So as we go along, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how uh, how we are going to be careful about that. But in any case, as we set up our, our null and our alternative, our hypotheses, we're always going to have the two of these. Now, what do these look like? Well, if we're doing a test of one mean, these come in three basic varieties. They can be left-tailed. They can be right-tailed, or they can be two-tailed. And just so you know, a left-tailed test means that if we got a sample that was very far in the left tail, we would reject the null, draw a conclusion that the null is false. The right-tailed ones mean that if we got a sample that was in the right tail, we would reject the null and draw a conclusion that the null is false. Two-tailed means that if it's in either tail, now, if they're in the middle, middle means consistent, right? That, that, that means we happen to get a sample that was consistent with the, uh, with the um, hypo null hypothesis. But, but the, the left tail, right tail, two tail is about which tail um, we're looking at. It's also about which tail we're measuring the size of. All right, now if we want a left tail test, what that means is that when we state our null, we're going to be stating something about the mean. And I'll, I'm suppressing the x here, but it's kind of it's there but hidden. And we're saying that the mean value of x is at least as large as some specific value, and I'm using mu0 as a placeholder here because depending on the context, that number can take on different values. On the other hand, we might have a um, we might have a right tail test over here. That right tail test would say that we are going to assume that instead the mean is smaller than, or at least as small as, some value. Finally, in a two-tailed scenario, we're going to make the assumption that the mean takes some specific value exactly. And that's our assumption. 
Now, in each of these cases, this null has to be paired with a very specific alternative. If we're assuming that the null is at least as large as some value, the alternative is that, in fact, no, it is smaller than that value. Similarly, in a right tail test, if we are assuming that the null is smaller, at least as small as some value, our alternative is that no, on the contrary, it is larger. And finally, the, the, the um, two-tail test, if the null says mu takes this specific value, the alternative says it takes some value, any value, except that, right? Not equal, equal, not equal is what we're looking at with two-tail. So how do you know which to choose? Well, it really does depend on the context. So let's say um, that we wanted to look at what, when would you use a left tail test? Let's say that there was some uh, unnamed sandwich company that we had been frequenting, and we started bringing a ruler with us because we felt like we had uh, been promised that the, uh, the average length of these sandwiches was at least uh, 12 inches. But we, were, we had a sneaking suspicion that that claim was false. We wanted to try to prove it false. And then we set that up like this. If we could prove that false, then the alternative would be true, which is that, in fact, the average length of that sandwich is less than 12 inches. And we had been uh, ill done by and should be compensated for our, uh, for our pain and suffering. And so that would be a scenario when you use left tail. When you want to prove some claim that something is a certain largeness to, uh, wrong so that you can sh show that instead it is small, the value is smaller than that. Um, for two tail test, let's imagine that instead of... Uh, a sandwich shop, we run, we run a bottling plant. And it is the case that we want to fill our um, our bottles, on average, to exactly 20 ounces. Now, if we're uh, underfilling them, then we run into the problems that our uh, unnamed sandwich shop ran into, legal liability. But if we're overfilling them, then we're losing money, right? We don't want to be giving 24 ounces of soda away uh, for, for the price of 20 ounces. And so in that case, we actually want information on um, deviations in either direction. In that scenario, uh, we could use a two-tailed test where um, if it's exactly 20, then the null would be consistent with what we see. Um, but if it's different, then we would um, then we would know, well, it depends on which way it is, but we're, we're testing for differences, just anything different than 20 ounces. That would be a case where you would use a, a two-tailed test. Uh, finally, when would you use a right tail test? Let's say that there was some consulting innovation that we thought we might want to bring. And uh, in order for us to make it worth our while to, um, to start to implement it uh, in our you know, multinational organization, we would require that on average it brought in $20,000 a month. Um, well, we could assume to be you know conservative that in fact the innovation on average is not is the, the monthly increase or the monthly revenue as a result of the information uh, innovation is not going to be twenty thousand dollars it's going to be smaller than that um, and then we put the benefit the, the burden of proof on the alternative which is that in fact we have to conclusively prove that it's more than twenty thousand dollars per month we might want to do that because it can be hard to go back once you've made an you know once you've made a big institutional change and so if we want to be careful about it we might put the alternative that we would yield a, a change in our behavior uh in in there so those are three examples of how you might uh use these now what i want to draw your attention to is that each of these attach themselves to um, to claims about the value of of mu right and uh, in this case we put 12 here let's put 20 here and in this case we've got 20,000 in all three of these cases we've got a greater than or equal to sign or a less than sign we've got equal sign not equal we've got a set of a paired set of what are called binary relations Binary because they take two values, right? Like mu and mu zero, mu and twelve. You could do it with three and four, um, and then the relation tells us is one bigger, is one smaller, is one equal, is one not equal. That's what makes them relations, and they're binary because they take two values. Um, in each of these cases, the binary relations are very carefully chosen. In a left-tailed test, the null says that either the you know the the specific value or anything larger than that. If, if mu takes those values, any of those values, then the null is covering that. And if mu takes not the, not the 12, but anything below it, anything below that claimed value, the hypothetical value of mu, then the alternative takes care of that. In a two-tail test, right, the null says the specified value is correct. Uh, and if that's wrong, right, any, any other value of mu, 
is covered by the alternative. So anything over here, anything over here, two-tailed test. Finally, if we look at a right-tailed test, the right-tailed test says the specified value any, and anything beneath it to the left. Well, that's correct. That's, that's what the null is, is asserting. And then the alternative says, well, not that value, but anything above that value. That all falls under the alternative. And what you see when you look at these number lines is that they are thoroughly covered. Um, that is to say that the assumptions set up by our hypotheses, these are exhaustive, meaning they, um, they cover everything. And so it must be the case that at least one of H0, HA must be true. Right. At least either H0 or HA has to be true. The other thing that we're setting up is that they're not only exhaustive, they're also mutually exclusive. Mutually exclusive says they can't both be true. And I mentioned earlier that we would be very careful. This is supposed to be an ampersand. Sorry, it looks like an 8. They, we, we would be very careful about how we set those up for a specific reason. And that specific reason is that if we have exhaustive and mutually exclusive claims, then if one is false, they at least one of them must be true and they can't both be true. So one and only the other must be true. One and only one must be true. And that's nice because what it means is if we can... If we assume the null and then prove a contradiction, that leads us back to the alternative. Okay, so um, so that's kind of the process, or I mean, that's kind of the concept of the null and the alternative. I want to kind of look at like in an example, when would what would it look like if uh, if you know if we wanted to try to put this into practice. So let's say we were uh, let's say we wanted to test a claim. We want to know if we can conclude that these cans of refried beans which are specified to be 15 ounces are actually being underfilled less than 15 ounces on average, right? That would be like a typical kind of sentence. It might be embedded in a larger problem. And it's also just a scenario that might happen if you're working in quality control. We want to know, can we conclude that these cans of beans are underfilled, right? What does underfilled mean? Well, this is what it means. That they're less than the stated value on average. Um, and whenever you're trying to do part one, step one in practice, you're always trying to find some statement, some assertion about the way the world works. Um, and then in there, you, you're trying to find the analogs because we're always going to be able to convert these to something that looks like this, right? So there's going to be an H0 and HA. There's going to be some uh, parameter that you're dealing with. There's going to be some set of binary relations and there's going to be some numerical value. Here we have, if we can conclude that, if you ever see if we can conclude that, that's a dead giveaway that what's coming next is the alternative. Because the only one you can conclude is true, conclude that, is the alternative. So what we know right there is that we are saying, is it the case that the following is true? And then we're looking for a parameter and it says on average, so that's very clearly mu x, less than, well that's just a less than sign, and then we need a number, and that's 15. And so inside this sentence in math, we can see, uh, or in English, we can see this mathematical assertion. The conclusion we could come to is that the average uh, filling weight of these cans of refried beans is less than 15. Now, if that's the alternative, then we need to come up with a mutually exclusive and exhaustive null, which is that, in fact, the average value is at least as large as and possibly larger than 15. And that's how this step one works when we put it into practice. I will say um, it takes practice to get good at finding kind of this language in there. I highly encourage that you use a highlighter or a pen or something, or uh, you can use highlighted text um, or write down the words and then try to you know write them down in different pen colors on your paper. 
Um, but practicing identifying the parts of the sentence that correspond. Um, all the work that you did back in uh, back in I don't know grade school, middle school, high school of um, on on finding prepositional phrases and all that stuff comes in handy. That these cans of refried beans contain like that's a uh, you know can we conclude being able to pull out parts of a sentence and correspond it to something that means something specific comes in really helpful. So uh, I know if it's been a while since you flex that muscle, I encourage you to. Okay, just to recap, when we're doing step one, we are going to be formulating a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. Often we'll create one first, and then we'll uh, you know fill in the blanks with the other. Uh, they come in three varieties. We've got left tail, two tail, and right tail. Oh, a little tip um, that I wanted to draw your attention to. I always forget which one's left tail, right tail, and two tail. And for me, what I do is I look at the alternative sign. The, the, the binary relation in the alternative. You can see that a left less than sign, if you were to turn it into an arrow, it's an arrow that points left, which is left tailed. This right here, this greater than sign, if you draw it into a little arrow, it points to the right. Um, and then this equal sign, I don't know if you just imagine turning it into a, a two way arrow, it's two tails, right? So that's what I do as just kind of a little mnemonic device when I'm looking to try to remember like, wait, which one's left tail, which one's right tail? That comes in handy later too when you get to step five. But for now, if you try to remember those, the alternative sign points in the direction. Less than is left tail, right, uh, greater than is right tail. Um, the, we select these binary relations to make sure that we have an exhaustive and mutually exclusive set of claims about the, the value of mu on this number line. Um, so that if one's false, then the other must be true. And then in practice, what we do is we try to find some statement about the way the world works and then convert it into the math that's going to help us uh, get to a place where we can move along to the next steps. I hope you found that useful. If you have questions, totally makes sense. Uh, drop a comment uh, or shoot me an email. I'm always happy to hear from you. And uh, I stay posted. We're going to um, we're gonna work on the next couple steps next. We're going to work our way through uh, just the steps, and then we're going to do some practice problems, and then we're going to move on forward with more types of hypotheses testing. Thanks a lot. This is Dr. D and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.